So, hi everyone, my name's Ashok, and I'm going to be presenting on front end performance, and uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, I work at the California Institute of the Arts as their systems analyst, and you can see the stuff I've done and read my thoughts at the links up there. And I have a really strong interest in server optimization, uh, both for the front end and for the back end. So, you know, we during this presentation, I will be talking about some back end optimizations to help speed up the front end. And this is basically settings that you tune on the server for faster downloads by your users. Um, there are some useful modules that will help out in the process as well. But unless stated, I'm assuming that the back end server is going to be Apache, though for some of the slides, I do say the settings regarding Nginx as well. Um, and in the latter half of the of the session, I'll be going through a little bit of CSS and JavaScript about uh, things you can do to help make it faster. And there will be some level of back and forth between the two. And if there are any questions along the way, just raise your hand and um, we'll, uh, I'll try and get to it. And if you have something to share, then just uh, come on up. Or if I say something uh, that's incorrect, then you know correct me on that as well, because I know there are some. Uh, performance enthusiasts in the room as well, like uh, the two guys from Four Kitchens who are sitting on the side there. Um, some of the resources that I've used uh, through this presentation, some of them are from folk that use Drupal and some of them are from people that don't. Uh, Constantin Kafer, uh, he's, he worked on Drupal for a long time. Steve Soders, who wrote the Y Sloma um, extension for Firefox and Chrome. Uh, Wim Leers. Uh, who's done a lot of the, who, who wrote the CDN module, and Adi Osmani, who, uh, who has talked a lot about uh, performance uh, for JavaScript. So, before we start getting into how to make all of these components faster, you first need to define your goals and objectives. Um, do you want a faster response to the end user on each page? Uh, is it more views that you're looking for that can be handled by your server? Um, do you want to minimize downtime? Because even though they're all related, they're slightly different. And some, you, you need to figure out what those objectives are before you can start tackling what you're doing. And in a lot of these cases, sometimes there are some low-hanging fruit that, you know, they're easy to implement, could be it on your server or in your code, and you'll see some huge improvements. And but once you get past those, it's going to get harder and harder to achieve um, more and more performance. Um, it could mean having more infrastructure or revisions in your JavaScript and CSS or revisions to your theme layer entirely. So before, so when you're defining all of these goals and trying to figure out all of this stuff, you then come into trying to diagnose what's happening on your server because that's when you're most likely going to be noticing all the possible issues that might be happening. And it's essential because before you start proposing and implementing some sort of solution, because you might be heading down some path and, you know, think that it's the JavaScript and CSS, that's, that's what needed to be revised, where it could, whereas it could be the settings on your server that were the problem all along. So you need to have some data that you can analyze. And based off of that, it can lead to a few different paths that, uh, that lead to optimization. So you know, I'm just going to talk about some of the points that you can do it through, um, the tools to measure and diagnose uh, these issues, and the speed optimizations that you can do. So the largest part uh, that takes up the front end of the site typically is media. And media, I mean loading the images, the style sheets, the JavaScript, they can all account for way more than 80% of the total load time. Uh, just to give an example, one of the sites that I have, it is, you know, for a 250 kilobyte download, only eight of those are to the actual HTML on the page. So you can, t you should try and take a look and see, you know, what is the overall load time? What is the page size and how much does it account for your total, uh, total page? Um, how much time does it take for the entire DOM to load and the page to render? And is it any more time to have that page actually functional? So 
you know, some tools that, that are really useful in this whole, uh, whole situation are the Firebug net panel, which will show you just how much time is being taken into downloading a page. So if I ran this on the Drupal Camp LA site for the session on, for the presenters thing, if you, let's see, if you go to the net tab and I hit refresh, it tells you what the size of the different components are and how much time it's taken for all of that to get rendered out. So in the end, it's taken about three seconds for the entire page to load up. And it's taken up 1.2 megs in this scenario. So, you know, you can get some sort of ideas from that and you can see what's taking up a large part of the things. Like this one logo that seems pretty big. And um, another tool that you can look at is YSlow. And this was developed by Steve Soders, who I had in one of the first slides. And it basically rates a web page based on many, many different criteria such as, um, are there a lot of style sheets on the page? Are there lots of uh, JavaScript uh, files on the, being loaded into your site? Um, are, there, are you serving it from a cookie-less domain, or is it from a CDN? And the list goes on and on. And it also gives you some performance uh, optimization suggestions as it's doing all of this. And it can also, in the same way that the net panel provides it, it provides page statistics for how big each of the different portions are, and if things are getting, you know, other things added in there, which I'll get into as well. So if I ran YSlow on the same page, it gets a rating of 79. Um, I just want to point out that, for the most part, anything that's above a 75 is generally fairly good, and once you're getting into 85 and above, that's pretty fantastic. And in this case, it says for to try and make fewer HTTP requests because there are lots of background images on the site. So maybe if they put it into an image sprite, that would help uh, get a better score and it would help speed the site up as well. Yes? Uh, I have a question to those tools uh, in regards to third party integrations to a site, like for example Twitter or Facebook, since they don't have to do overall page load time, mm -hmm. but they're loaded after the rest of your page is already loaded. Uh, it affects those type of things greatly. So page, I mean, I turn them off, I get a page score, if you will, I turn them on, and down the bottom. Right. Is there any way, any tool that you said, say, hey, just, I don't have to do anything manual, just a quick workaround, better look at your page? Um, so, just so I can understand the question a little bit better, and it's repeated for the screencast as well, are you asking, is there a better way to configure the rules that are applied for the rating of the page, so that um, you get a more accurate reading of what's happening. And in the case of YSlow, there is. So if I go home, uh, actually on any of the tabs, you'll see this section called Rule Sets. And you can actually edit it. And you can say which of the different criteria you want graded on the page. Or you can treat it as a small site or blog. or It has different presets already defined from the get-go. So in my case, for the most part, I'm not using a CDN. So that's one of the checks that I might not do, and then try and rate the page after that point. And it'll give you a different score based off the different criteria that you have. So suddenly, when, if your site is a 75, just by taking off that CDN check, it might be an 84 or an 85. So um, your question is valid, and I, I hope that answers that question. OK, great. So Google PageSpeed is another one. And it's also fairly similar to YSlow. So I'm not sure if it has that same kind of functionality in being able to do the different rule sets uh, in there. And if I go in for Google PageSpeed, it has a tab you know, to analyze the performance. And if I click it, the nice thing about it is that it actually gives um, some nicer suggestions to you. Like in the case of this, you can see that the page speed score is kind of bad. And my guess would be it's, and it says it, to optimize the images. And if you look at it, it says optimizing the following images could reduce the size by 600 kilobytes on the page. So that's a big chunk of, uh, of reduction that could be done. And it's that same logo. 
And finally, you also have the Google Chrome Developer Panel, which essentially has the page speed built into it. It's really powerful, and the great thing about it is that it has an auditor section, which can help track the speed of the JavaScript that you have running on the page. And yeah. Uh, another tool that you can use, and this has a Drupal module for it, is Episodes. And it does the same kind of thing that uh, the uh, Chrome Developer Panel has in terms of uh, measuring out the JavaScript that's going on on the page. The nice thing with this is it, I believe it's slightly more granular, so you can kind of section off portions on and see how uh, different portions are, um, how fast th those different uh, pieces are on the page. So uh, yeah, give it a try. And like I said, there's a Drupal module for it, so it's pretty easy to plug in. And as far as non-browser tools are concerned, um, there's one from AOL called AOL Page Test. And I find this one actually pretty good. Um, let's just go to that. It will give you, it'll give you a diagram of basically how long the page is taking to load. And it'll do it two times. One is if it was downloading the page from scratch. And the second for when a person is repeating a visit on the page or some sort of sub page. So it's trying to see if, um, you know, certain content is being reviewed, returned back as being cached or anything like that. So. The second view sort of handles the browser caching aspect. Yes, precisely. So you know, the first page view might be taking 600 kilobytes, but then the second one might be taking 10, just for the HTML portion of things. So it's really good about that stuff. Uh, let's see. I think it's fully done. Great. And it says, um, let's see. So the first view took 2.8 seconds, and the second view took 0.6 seconds. So it's, it is serving a good chunk of the content from the cache in this uh, scenario. And a similar tool, tool to that is from Pingdom. Um, it does the same kind of thing. It shows a waterfall diagram, much like the AOL page test does. But I find the first one to be a little bit better. And if you're strictly testing out JavaScript, then I, I recommend going to a site called jsperf.com. Uh, and you can, like it says, you can test out snippets of JavaScript on there. So you can test out how one type of selector or whatever you have performs against another type of selector with uh, given HTML. And they have some... Uh, not just some examples, but they have some actual tests that people have done uh, to do to compare those kinds of things on there. And it goes through some pretty rigorous testing. So it's pretty cool. And if you want to try and improve your CSS, uh, there's a site called CSSLint.com. And you can just plug in the CSS that you have on that site, and it'll give you suggestions on improving your CSS. Um, certain things, you know, you might agree or disagree on, like, one of the things is they recommend not using IDs in your CSS, which, you know, I guess there's, you know, you can make arguments both ways on it. But there are other things that clearly say, like, you know, not having so many, not having your selectors go so, uh, to so many levels, because that's, that is going to be a definite hit on the performance. So you can take those pieces of advice and, you know, apply it to your page. And now I'll just jump right into uh, things you can do. So the first suggestion I would have is, uh, and this is regarding the back end, is to reduce the requests. Um, every file that you serve to the user produces an HTTP request. So, you know, if on my page I have 30 files, there, that's 30 requests. And it's better to have fewer requests on a page with larger files than to have many requests with smaller files. So if I can somehow cut those 30 requests down to 15 um, and just make them larger, well, I'm going to get a lot better performance. And most browsers at this point can da support downloading at least four components in parallel. So, you know, the fewer components you have, obviously, it's going to be able to download all of those that much quicker. Um, and based off of the reducing the requests, one of the large one of the best things you could do is try and combine all of the different background images that you have together into one sprite sheet. 
And this example that I have here is for uh, Google's checkout. And this is what their background image looks like. And when you look at their CSS, then they just change the positions on the, on the page to be able to show the button appropriately. And the second thing would be to aggregate your different scripts and styles. And thankfully, this is already built into Drupal for the most part. Um, and I say for the most part because as of Drupal 7, um, because of it trying to uh, create bundles together so that different um, files don't keep getting downloaded over and over depending on the different pages, like um, the Drupal Core JS and all of that stuff that's there, um, they've tried to split it up into many more files than before. So you might see a little bit of uh, a performance decrease, at least as far as the front end is concerned, jumping from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7. And I would recommend just paying attention to what happens with uh, the bundle cache at um, drupal.org slash project slash uh, WPO. And what that project is aiming to do is try and create smarter bundles. So based on the page you're on and uh, what's being served on the different pages, it aims to try and um, make the number of uh, aggregated files that are split up into all these multiples uh, into larger and larger files. So the more common ones will eventually start getting put into one, as opposed to being split across two or three different files. Um, these are more aggressive things you could do as far as uh, reducing your request is concerned. Um, instead of using background images, you could use C um, CSS. And I'm not referring to the border radius and all of that stuff, because that's something nice to be able to do in CSS anyways. But I'm more specifically referring to using image data in CSS. So converting your data into base64 format and having this giant gibberish that you see here representing an image is one way to have your images be in um, in one file, but at the same time, it's probably not the best idea. <laughs> and similarly, you can use font data in CSS, and instead of having font files, you could have them embedded into the CSS file as well. Again, you could have you could argue for it one way or the other, but I like to be able to see my font file as a font file. Um, the second suggestion would be trying to use a CDN if you have the budget for it. Um, the biggest advantage with this, with using most of the CDNs that are out there, is that most of the servers are scattered around the world, so it will reduce the round trip times. So if someone from um, India is trying to access my blog, um, and if I have all of this content serving from a CDN, it's going to be a much faster experience for them or more pleasant experience for them, for that matter, as well, as opposed to um, just hitting my server all the time and just having all of that latency in between it. Um, and also, the other thing would be that um, since, let's say, if you're only serving static files from that CDN, uh, it does free up your server to be able to serve other legitimate kinds of requests. So one of the sites that I was working on, um, before I used a CDN, it could process around 150 requests per second. And adding a CDN in and only focusing on the, on the static content increased the performance to 200 requests per second. So, you know, it, it's, it was pretty decent. And um, aside from the larger ones like Akamai, uh, some of them are relatively inexpensive. Like, I, I've seen a couple that are as low as 7 cents per gig. So it's definitely worthwhile to just shop around and see uh, what the different pricing is and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, second, and my third suggestion would be to try and have caching enabled on the server. And by caching, what I mean uh, is what someone else had said before, is your server serving only legitimate um, content that's potentially changed. If you don't have it turned on, then what would happen is that for all the images that, or all the CSS or all the JavaScript that you have on your site, um, the client, the browser, is going to keep assuming that, oh, it might have changed. Let me download that again. So if you have caching enabled, you could have it be you know, for one day or two days or whatever. 
And what will happen is that that file will then be stored on their computer for a certain amount of time. And then it'll just see, oh, this looks like I've already downloaded it before. Let me just serve it from, you know, my, uh, from the local hard drive as opposed to trying to download it again. So, like I showed with my blog, instead of it taking, let's see, let me see that again. Instead of it taking 2.8 seconds to load up, it took 0.655. And if I try to look at just how much uh, was downloaded, it shows it right here. So the first time it took 272, uh, it downloaded 272 kilobytes. The second time around it downloaded 14. And that's because of the caching. So that's a huge difference. So what's that 14 they read? That's just your, your... That's just my HTML page. HTML. Yes. So most of it is controlled by the HTTP headers for all of this stuff. And like I said, the browser just checks if the content is still fresh. So you would just have to set your expires header to a date sometime in the future. Um, and since I'm specifically referencing Apache in this one, uh, one of the things could be, you know, if it's inside the CSS directory, turn on expires active and make it be, um, make the caching enabled for two weeks. And if it's something else, like let's say an image, make it one month. And in the case of Nginx, I am basically saying in this rule set, if it's a CSS or JS file, it will be 30 days before that piece of content is expired and it should get downloaded again by a browser. Um, the disadvantage with something like this is obviously if you're working on a site that's you know still in development and you know you've pushed it onto your production server, uh, obviously you might still have some changes going on. And if you don't have all of the aggregation, all of that stuff enabled, then even if you're making changes to your um, CSS or JavaScript, the user's going to see an old look and feel for the site. So you might want to try and change the file names or URL when you're updating these files, or a better option would be just turn on the uh, uh, CSS and JavaScript aggregation. Um, I would definitely suggest trying to serve all your content, not all of it, but all of the content that's potentially in text format in uh, as gzip. And it's just going to compress the text content and send that to the user and let their browser and computer deflate it. Yes? Question on GZIP. Um, I tried this with our uh, servers, but for some reason the, the actual uh, processing required to GZIP and send over uh, was a higher impact than it would have saved by GZIP content. So how do you weigh, how do you optimize that potentially? Um, so the question was, just so everyone else heard it, you had content that when you gzipped it, took a longer time to get um, more processed. Power in order to right. Press it, send it, and it, send it than it would have otherwise. So how do you make a determination between processing and speed? Say? Okay. Um, was the gzipping happening on each request? Because it should have happened, the, the file should get gzipped once, and then the and then the Apache and and then the HT Access file, or if it was an nginx, um, it should just take care of sending the gzipped version of that file afterwards. So there's an initial performance decrease, but then anyone else that's requesting those files afterwards um, would see an improvement in the speed. So, like the example I have here for the Red Cat site. Uh, the initial page size was 700 kilobytes. Uh, G-zipping it went down to 380 kilobytes. So yes, again, there was that initial performance decrease, but you're serving less bandwidth ultimately, and then anyone else that comes to the site and is getting content is getting a file that's already gone through that processing. So um, it would still be better to do it in that format. And here, I say it, the CSS went down from 120 kilobytes to 25, so it was a huge difference. Um, Where would Apache have stored uh, GZIP's uh, versions? If it's not doing it on the fly. 
trying to remember it now. I think I believe that's correct. I believe it does it in memory. And you can can you specify it as well? Okay. Okay. So most likely it goes into the temp directory yeah. in in most cases. And sometimes it's JSON, or sometimes it doesn't have to be of the JSON, so you have more compression. Um. So it'll do an MD5 of the JSON to do more compression. Yeah. 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 If your content is way more than the memory you have? Yeah. Um, well, images should not be getting gzipped. Um, they can't really get gzipped. You're not going to see a huge difference in that kind of thing. Same thing. This is mainly for, for text, like in CSS and in JavaScript. And, um, yeah. So if your CSS and JavaScript are getting too big, then you should probably revisit that. If it's not getting stored in memory. Um, this is getting back to the first suggestion that I had, which was for reducing requests. And this is for, um, this is parallelization. And what I'm, what that basically means is instead of serving all of your content from one domain, like in my case, let's say btmash.com, you could have other domains that uh, static content could, could get served from, like static.btmash.com. So most browsers allow for more than two connections for each host. Uh, in the case of IE8, um, or sorry, let me remember what I mean by all of this. This is this from that first slide that I had. Um, like in the case of IE8, it'll allow six parallel downloads going on at the same time on each host. For Firefox 3, it's six. Chrome, six. Safari and Opera, it's four. Um, so if you have multiple domains, that, like let's say btmash.com and static.btmash.com, then you're basically downloading eight, file, eight files if I was using Safari at the same time as opposed to just four if I was serving everything from btmash. And... But you also want to just make sure that you don't saturate it with too many hosts because um, there's only so much uh, benefit that you'll see. In, the most case, uh, in most cases, two or three is, is the best thing. So you could have images.domain.com and um, css.domain.com or something like that. But it's something for you to decide. And... A module that you can use that will help with all of this is the CDN module. Um, despite what the name says, it doesn't actually have to be tied to a CDN. Um, you could actually just point it to your own server with a different domain, and users can download more of the page at the same time. That's a, that's a pretty simple way to start off on it. And then eventually, once you do have a CDN or something like that, then you could. Then it will automatically take advantage of it at that point. Um, so my sixth suggestion is um, having a persistent HTTP connection and all that will mean is if you have a persistent connection then it tries and makes sure that whenever all of these downloads are occurring it doesn't try and reconnect with the server and close it off on each request. It keeps that connection open so then it can just quickly retrieve the file. Uh, because what happens is that the opening and closing of those connections also take some amount of time. And just having that persistent thing, uh, you know, gets rid of it. And in all honesty, it's, it's really easy to put it on. In the case of Apache, you just make sure Keep Alive is not turned off. And I think Nginx has that by default. You have to explicitly say Keep Alive off, whatever its variant is for Nginx. Um, you want to try and remove any unnecessary modules that may be in your backend. And by modules, in this case, I'm not referring to Drupal modules, 
but I'm referring to any of the server, um, to the web server modules that might be on there. Things like mod CGI or mod proxy or mod dev. Uh, sometimes when you're running Ubuntu or something like that and you, and you just install Apache, it'll enable these modules by default. And there's a chance that you probably don't need them. So just disabling them will lower the memory usage of your web server on a per connection basis as well. So it'll treat your server a little bit better. So you can handle more users. And Nginx itself is not that much of an issue since it already starts off uh, in a pretty lightweight state and you have to add modules to it as you're going forward with it. Um, I'm not going to go into into varnish in this presentation. It'll be a I'll talk a little bit about it in the next one, but it is very lightweight and it because of the kind of thing that it serves and how it serves it, it makes no difference. There aren't really uh, settings that you would have for this kind of stuff. So now that we're out of the whole back end area, we can get into theme suggestions and then eventually into the uh, other performance suggestions. So one thing you can do is you can have, you should have all of the CSS at the top of your page. And by that I just mean just place it in head. Uh, the page is rendered when all the CSS in the header is loaded. So, you know, loading the CSS later might cause some re-rendering and users might see some flash of um, unstyled content on the site. And Using link is faster than import, so this is something you don't really have to worry about too much since it's all kind of in Drupal and there's a lot of magic happening regarding the stuff in the back end. And it automatically handles itself between all that stuff. And the second suggestion that's tied to this is trying to have the JavaScript at the bottom. And typically it's placed right before the body tag ends. And loading the scripts can um, because loading the scripts can block the page rendering, since downloading the JS files will block downloads of another file type. And um, the scripts are downloaded sequentially, so you want to try and use graceful degradation. So don't have some sort of event handlers right in the code itself. Try and have them be, you know, Drupal behaviors or inside um, jQuery functions or something like that. So it's a little bit more graceful about all the stuff that's happening. Um, this is something that thankfully comes with, actually it doesn't really come with Drupal, sorry. Um, you want to try and minify your JavaScript and CSS. Just so, And what it'll do is it might remove some of the comments and the white space, all of that kind of stuff that you have. And you might see some pretty good savings out of that. Um, and you'll see definitely see some savings once you have GSIP enabled on the server as well. As of right now, I don't think there are any modules for D7, but one of the solutions that you can use is um, the Google Closure compiler to minify and pack um, whatever JavaScript or uh, whatever JavaScript you might have. Um, the CSS does slightly get minified when you aggregate it, but you can use uh, PageSpeed to get rid of some unused CSS as well, and um, you know, uh, try and make it a little bit cleaner that way. Um, you can you can reduce and you should reduce the image size like you saw from the Drupal Camp LA site one of the images was 680 odd kilobytes and it could be reduced down to I think it was 50 uh, yeah it was a pretty big difference um, the Google page speed will help report on how much an image can get compressed and if you're using some of the core stuff in D7 or if you're using the image cache module, then you can try and have it set up so any of the uploaded images are served by image cache uh, in D6. And you know that's what the user sees in the end. Um, you can try and use something called lazy initialization. And Basically, since JavaScript can take some time to initialize, um, you try and defer some of the setup work so that you know it can happen uh, later on in the page. Or another way you can do this is only load images when they need to be displayed. So 
you know, if let's say if I have some sort of carousel and people are not going to be seeing certain images on that page, just have them get start getting downloaded when the person is actually going to be seeing them. So for the old CalArts study DU website that we had, we did have such an such an image carousel. And before we implemented the uh, the uh, the lazy load for all of this stuff, the the site would take up about around 650 kilobytes on the first page load. After I added in the lazy load um, JavaScript to try and tackle all of this stuff, that first loading took 250 kilobytes. So I saw savings from all of that. And since in this kind of scenario, new images are only going to be downloaded when it's getting requested. If the user leaves the site early, then I'm saving, um, saving some bandwidth that way as well. So, and there's a mod, there is a jQuery module or plugin, plugin that will only load content that's above the fold or what the user can see, and that's the link for it. And just as a note, all of the slides will be up online as well, so then you can try and click through the links and, you know, read all of this stuff uh, uh, thoroughly. So, now we get into CSS improvements, and in all honesty, um, some of the gains are pretty small. Um, like I said right at the beginning, there have been some recent recommendations to uh, that say to try and use classes as opposed to IDs. Because IDs are faster, but from the testing that's been done and from at least the benchmarks that I've seen, the performance difference is really tiny, like a matter of milliseconds. And classes are much more flexible than IDs would be. You can only use an ID once, a class you can use again and again. Um, you should try to limit yourself to a second level selector. So, you know, class one and class, child class two. Um, especially if you're using uh, CSS3 selectors, like um, not A, not, not of type A and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, Google PageSpeed really helps uh, show which of your selectors could be improved. So if I went back to, let's see, let's give it a try here. If I went back to the page speed, at the very bottom, it has a portion on using efficient CSS selectors. And in the case of the Drupal Camp LA website, obviously all of this content is being aggregated. But let's say it wasn't. Um, it shows that there are 64 very inefficient rules and 116 inefficient rules. And then it'll just tell you there's this one rule that has two descendant selectors and so on and so forth. So you can try and do something about it. Uh, obviously some of this stuff is going to be in Drupal core itself and you can't really do all that much, but still it gives you some guidelines on things you could try and do to improve the CSS that you do have at control over. And now we'll just go into some jQuery improvements. Obviously, using Drupal 7 is a better idea in this respect because newer releases of jQuery are generally faster. And if you're looking for the latest release of jQuery to use on your site, then using the jQuery update module might be worthwhile to look at. Um, just a small tip. If you're going to call on the same selectors over and over again on your page, try and save them to a variable. Um, because then that way it's not trying to get to that um, particular object, um, you know, trying to figure out what that object is again and again. It's just, it's, it's worthwhile. Uh, you should see a good speed boost just based off of that. And we're going to go through some of these, but uh, doing performance improvements in jQuery, it's a large area because not all selectors are equal. Um, ID and element selectors are generally the fastest because that's just it's built into core JavaScript. Um, the class selectors are slightly slower. And if you try and do any selections, object selectors based on pseudo, uh, pseudo uh, data that's associated with it, those are the slowest. And like I mentioned, near the beginning, you should try and check out uh, jsperf.com because uh, it does show some of the different uh, selectors and their speeds and the jQuery team themselves uses 
jsperf.com to try and um, figure out what's happening or which is faster. So going right into this, if you're going to be doing a selector for an element based, like let's say if it was in the form of, you know, dot class dot child class one, um, using, you know, let's say this was the uh, parent version of it, uh, using find is actually faster than using you know context dot child with uh, with parent since the latter actually has to get parsed right back into this um, if you try and use parent dot children it's fifty percent slower than either one of either than the than the fastest option if you try to use a parent ID to get to its child it's seventy percent slower and if you use what would normally be you know, a selector that you see in CSS, pound parent dot child, it's 80% slower. So um, that's a big difference. Using find is the best way. And even using pound parent find child, it is slower, but it's 16% slower than the fastest thing. And I mean, if you cache it later on, then, you know, you're still going to see some big gains from all of this stuff. So, you know, as I said before, just try and get it stored into a variable if you're going to reuse it again and again. And um, you don't always have to use jQuery. And this was something that was found that, you know, using um, a cached item and going by its, uh, use, getting the ID attribute of it is 80 to 90% slower than just doing item.id. So, you know, if it's something that's already built into the core of JavaScript, try and use that instead of using some of the jQuery-fied versions of that stuff. And, you know, I've already said it twice, but I'll mention it this third time, and I promise I won't mention it again. Try and cache your results to a variable. Um, I have a link to something from jsperf.com. Um, I, I recommend going to it when you get a chance. And in my case, when I tested this out, the difference between a variable that got cached and then had selector work done on it versus something that was uncached, it showed that it was, in this case, 56% slower. So, yeah, uh, cache it. Sorry, that was the fourth time. Um, you want to try and chain your methods on a selector because, for the most part, it is faster than separate calls. Um, and it's, it's also a little bit nicer to look at because you can kind of see that. Uh, step one is happening, then step two, and then step three, and so on and so forth, as opposed to it being on separate lines. So faster looks better. Seems like a win-win to me. Um, try and keep your append calls to a minimum if you if you need them. So whenever you're appending content into you know some sort of div or whatever it might be, um, try and get all of it processed and then put it in one call as opposed to you know, two or three or four, because it can be really costly, and you can see the number in nice, bright, bold uh, letters. And well, that's that's really it. We can we can definitely talk about this some more, and if there are some questions, I'm happy to answer them. Or you know, I'm going to have another presentation right after this, but I know the after dark stuff is happening, so we can talk about stuff then as well, and. I'm not entirely sure which of these presentations have happened today um, or not, but um, I think the Drupal design skills presentation, the theme design Q&A panel, and possibly the designing future-proof websites might be related or useful presentations to go to based off of this stuff. And that's it. Are there any questions? Yes? Okay, so the question was if I have a, if I want to minify files, 
where in my workflow do I do that whole process? Um, typically, or what I'm starting to do at least, since I'm starting to do the minification of my files and everything, is I'll still keep the original versions of the files and then I'll create a minified version of it as, as a supplement right next to it. So I'll have, um, let's say it's a JavaScript file that's um, J, like in the, let's see, jQuery selector.js. I might have a second one that's j, jQuery selector.min.js. And then I'll just have references to that in my module or in my theme or whatever it might be. So then that's how I'm keeping track of it at that, at that stage. And then any changes that I'm making are going to be to the original, and then I'm going to do the minification alongside it. Yes. Um, are there any other questions? Yes? So the, the technique that you talked about where you get a boost by having parallel servers serving the name. Uh, parallel domains. Yeah, parallel domains. Would you still get that? Or do you, the way you implemented it, do you have it just as a virtual host on the same hardware, or do you have separate hardware? Um, in my case, I had it on the same hardware though you could have it on a separate piece of hardware if you wanted to as well. Um, like I said, uh, just splitting it out, in my, in my case I felt like it was future-proofing it because let's say if we decided to move to a CDN, we could just have those uh, particular domains point to the CDN and then you know, it does all of the stuff that it needs to after that. But yeah, I just had it as virtual hosts on my Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you.